Good morning. It is January 23rd, uh, 2022, and I am your host at today's meeting. I'll be your MC. I want to welcome you to the Sunday morning meeting of the Humanists of Greater Portland. Humanists of Greater Portland is a chapter of the American uh, Humanist Association. Humanism is an outlet, look, or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than supernatural matters. Humanists, believe, uh, humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and seek rational ways to solve human problems through science, reason, and respect for the human condition. Our topic at today's meeting, street yeah. epistemology, <laughs> will address the humanist commitment of peace and social justice, humility, empathy, and altruism. HGP is an all-volunteer group uh, that believes strongly in freedom of speech. Lauren, uh, Lauren Beauregard is our reader this morning. Welcome, Lauren. Come on in and, uh, oh, and prepare sure. your reading. Yes. Uh, the book is called Cynical Theories, yeah. but it has a very intriguing subtitle. It's called how activist scholarship made everything about race, gender, and identity, and why this harms everybody. And the, the, there's two authors, Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. I will begin the reading by saying that uh, what I'm doing is uh, giving an edited description of what you find on the dust cover of the book that I just flashed. So here goes. There's a French postmodern philosopher who has claimed that science is a sexist activity. Her name is Lucy Irigare. She wrote that, and this is serious now, she wrote that E equals MC squared is a sexed equation because it privileges the speed of light over other speeds. This is a postmodern French philosopher. Irigare also claimed that fluid mechanics is unfairly neglected in classical physics because it would have to deal with feminine moisture in contrast to the way in which physics treats rigid rods. Beyond the so-called postmodern, there are social justice warriors who claim not only that all white people are racist, but also that only white people can be racist. This idea is that people of color don't have any power, and for that reason, they cannot be racist. Once you get all of that, then you begin to understand what white fragility could possibly mean. Such ideas annoy people like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Jordan Peterson, and John McWhorter. See what comes in the wake of woke. First, you have cancel culture. One example of that is something we've already seen. The American Humanist Association has rescinded Richard Dawkins' 1996 Humanist of the Year Award. And they did the same with atheist physicist Lawrence Krauss, who apparently had a naughty habit of harassing women. Probably the most egregious idea that postmodernism has is about epistemology. This is the topic for today. Their idea is that knowledge is nothing more than a social construct. In other words, there's no such thing as knowledge referring to a world that's not of our own making. It's all mental. It's all social. In other words, no such thing as objective physical reality. A related idea is that science and reason themselves are nothing but tools of oppression. If we value science and reason, if we value morality and ethics, then we must challenge all orthodoxies, whether they're right wing, left wing, and however fashionable they may be in academic circles, in culture, or in the mass media at large. I would now like to welcome today's, uh, our today's speaker. Uh, Roman Tarasov is a communication coach, 
critical thinking enthusiast and a board member of uh, Street Epistemology International. SEI was founded in 2019 with the mission to encourage and normalize critical thinking and skepticism while providing people around the world with the resources needed to develop and promote ongoing conversations using uh, street epistemology uh, tools and techniques. Roman uh, lives in Moscow, but comes to us today from Thailand, where he is escaping the Russian winter. Uh, welcome, Roman. So glad that you're able to come to us at one o'clock in the morning, your time. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much, Helen. I'm happy to be here and I'm excited to talk to you. So as Helen has mentioned, I'm here today to talk to you about street epistemology. Here's how it's written. It is a conversational approach that is designed to have productive conversations about a variety of different topics, beliefs, you might say, or claims. And uh, I've been already told that Peter Bogosian was here a few years back, and I'm guessing he also talked about street epistemology. So maybe for some of you, I will refresh uh, the memory and maybe say a few new things about it. Um, my plan for today's talk is to just briefly say a couple of words about what it is, about some of the tools that we use, and share the uh, spend the last part of this talk uh, talking about what evidence do we have, if any, that it works? Or how does it work? Does it work at all? Uh, as was mentioned in the in the uh, intro. So let's begin. Uh, Smalls is a conversational tool. It's designed to have conversations, but not about anything. For example. Uh, I wouldn't suggest using epistemology to talk about uh, what my favorite movie is or uh, whether I'm feeling hungry at the moment. But what it is designed to talk about is this, how the world is. For example, claims about our physical reality. Uh, the earth is round or the th theory of evolution is true. Uh, claims like that would be uh, very much suited for a discussion using street epistemology method, uh, and also how we want our world to be. For example, abortions should be legalized, or vaccines should be uh, obligatory for everyone. Any of any topics uh, like that are perfect for street epistemology conversations. So, as you may as you might imagine, uh, there is an unlimited amount of different and interesting topics starting from politics and religion and ending with science that you might want to discuss using epistemology. Uh, now let's talk about what is the focus of this method, uh, how it differs from maybe other, from ordinary conversations that we might have in our daily life. And for that, we can use this metaphor. It's a tree and it has our brain and the roots and uh, you can see different beliefs there is uh, spread out uh, as leaves or uh, anything, something like that and each person each of us can have an unlimited amount of beliefs or claims that we can have i believe in this and that and all kinds of stuff but there is a very limited amount of ways of how each of us get to those beliefs and it is represented here as methods uh, as a trunk of this tree and this is those methods are actually the focus the main focus usually of serious small conversations because when we talk about how we come to our conclusions how we arrive to to our beliefs how we think we know what we think we know is uh can, can just be very influential because whatever methods we use, we use them for all kinds of beliefs. So if even if we were to change one of the beliefs, but not change the methods we use, we would still come to uh, a vast majority of our beliefs uh, using old methods. And if they are unreliable, 
Well, so would be the beliefs. So that is street epistemology in a nutshell. And let's talk about some key components of effective street epistemology conversation. And just as this disclaimer, I will not be teaching you how to do street epistemology today, at least not much, because uh, 40 minutes to one hour wouldn't be enough for that anyways. And also because of the reasons that uh, we've decided to talk about why do we think it works uh, more than what should we do to make it work for us. But still, I will mention several key components of effective street epistemology conversations. And first one would be to use your conversation partner's vocabulary. That means even if you know some smart words like falsification or experiment or a random study, you don't have to use them unless your interlocutor or your conversation partner also understands them just as well as you do and you can be on the same ground while when discussing these things. So as a rule of thumb, just uh, try to understand where your conversation partner comes from and uh, use their vocabulary. Don't impose your terms on them. Another tool that we frequently use is explore their reasoning, not yours. This is a hard one because uh, I guess intuitively we all think in terms of how we think about anything. Even if your conversation partner tells you what they believe in and why they believe it, you still process it through your own ways of uh, reasoning because what else would you do, right? But one common mistake people usually uh, make in conversations is try to, again, impose your reasoning on your conversation partner. That usually doesn't work because even if we're talking about the same thing, we want to understand how, how our conversation partner is thinking about what we're discussing at the moment uh, and not how you're thinking about it because those could be completely different things. And understanding your interlocutor, understanding them as fully, as deeply as you possibly can would be a good first step to a productive conversation. If we start just um, counter, uh, counter arguing uh, what we hear or just shifting the conversation to our perspective, usually that, that would make our conversation partner either bored or defensive or uh, something else that we might not want to see. So that would be another important tool. Just try to set aside your ego for the time being and understand your conversation partner as fully as you can. Another thing is explore the method, not the conclusion. Getting back to this tree metaphor, we want to focus usually on the trunk of this tree, not on the leaves, not on the uh, a specific leaf of this tree that we have maybe even started our conversation with. And usually we start with something, some claim or belief, maybe I believe in uh, God or evolution or uh, anything, uh, anything what you want to discuss. But from there, we want to go deeper to the trunk of this tree. How have you come to this conclusion? What, what is your main reason for that? What ways uh, of reasoning are you using to, to realize that this is the correct conclusion? And what other possible methods could we use to check that? All kinds of uh, questions like this could be asked. Don't quote me, uh, it would depend on the context, of course. All right, this is important. And next one is no less important. It's about collaboration and rapport. Again, we want to be uh, polite. We want to have maintained rapport throughout the whole conversation with our conversation partner. Otherwise, it just wouldn't make sense if we attack, if we defend that uh, does not usually lead to productive conversation, at least not in my experience. 
So yeah, th this is very important. We suggest always keeping track of rapport levels between us and our organization partners. And if, if uh, you suspect that something goes the wrong way, just make sure that it's okay to proceed. And if not, either disengage or try to rectify the situation before going further. Another tool would be aporia, or otherwise known as moments of reflection. Uh, that ideally, if that happens when you ask a great question or just say something that, that makes your conversation partner genuinely stop and start reflecting on what they are actually believing, this might uh, look like um, they looking somewhere at the ceiling or uh, just pausing in the moment. And this is important. Th these are good things. You, this is usually a good sign, not always, of course, but if that happens, a suggestion would be to not break the pause and just let the person think. Let them be there in that moment and think for themselves, because that's what we ultimately want. We want people to think for themselves because we, it's just the only way uh, there is because you can't make people think what you want them to think. You can only help them. And that's the best we can hope for. And that's where street of cosmology could be handy. Uh, so if you want to ask yourself whether, uh, whether you have conducted a street of cosmology conversation or not, how do you even know whether it was street of cosmology or not, Here's a rule of thumb for you. You can say that you have conducted a street of small conversation if you had maintained rapport throughout the conversation and you have managed to at least start exploring reliability of reasoning of, of this trunk of the street of the underlying methods that a person uses to come to the conclusions that they come to. If you just managed to hit those two bullet points, then you can safely say that, yes, you have indeed conducted a street small conversation. Those two are not the only ones that you should look at, but it, those, those are probably the main points that you want to hit and you want to keep in mind throughout the conversation. All right, so next, in order to talk about whether street small works, or doesn't work, we, we need to first talk about what, what does it work for? What goals does street epistemology pursue? So let's talk about that for a couple of minutes. Uh, personal goals uh, that street epistemology can help you with would be at least some of them to improve reliability of reasoning. We want to uh, construct more accurate maps of reality. Uh, we want to have more accurate beliefs, uh, the same. We also might want to improve social skills because when we learn how to ask better questions, how to be a better conversation partners, uh, that might uh, provide us all kinds of benefits in terms of social skills. We want to have ultimately more efficient discourse. For example, for the same goals, you ideally you want to um, spend less time and less effort and have a nicer relationship uh, in the end, uh, have a, a nicer, uh, more, more efficient moments of aporia, things like that. So that is what Street of Smology is designed to help you with. And those were personal goals that you might want to pursue when uh, or whether uh, you decide to learn street epistemology. And now let's talk about the goals related to your conversation partner in conversation, what you might want to achieve in each conversation. First, it would be better understanding. We want to first understand each other because if you don't do that, anything else, to be honest, probably wouldn't make much sense. Uh, at least it wouldn't be uh, a conversation uh, per se. It might be a talk, it might be a debate maybe, but not probably a genuine productive conversation where, where both sides are open and willing to honestly reflect on what they are believing. 
and that's probably what we want. So that's this is the first step. Next step is we want to ultimately collaborative uh, engage in collaborative critical thinking together with our conversation partner. Uh, this is important. Again, we, we don't want to just uh, share some facts. We don't want to just um, say what we want to say, but we want to we want genuine engagement in critical thinking. That's the one of the ultimate goals here. Also, sometimes we want to change minds, of course, because uh, we we might know something that our interlocutor does not and we want uh, to help them reflect on it, or maybe we might believe that uh, our, uh, I don't know, family members or friends hold some beliefs that might be, I don't know, de detrimental for, for them, for example, and we might want to change minds um, or at least help them to reflect. And of course, for that, we first need to be open to changing minds ourselves. If I am not open to genuinely changing my views, it would probably be rather futile uh, if I would just try to change minds of other people. So yeah, start with yourself here, but still this, this happens that we want to change minds. And last thing I want to mention is maintaining relationships in, in place of disagreement that I guess we have all I've been there, maybe with the family members, even our close friends. We might disagree about something. Could be vaccines, could be religion, could be politics, anything, and it might just um, be detrimental to our relationship. And we don't want that, obviously. So for that as well, sort of epistemology might be handy because uh, it it is designed to be very polite and we've maintained rapport and by the end of the conversation if you do everything right you should respect each other even more not less than than you did in the beginning of the conversation so that's to the possible goals that we might want to hit when doing street epistemology and now we want to understand does it actually work that does this approach help us to achieve those goals, right? And to answer this question, um, let's first talk about if you were in the shoes of a person who wanted to have the most productive conversation they, they, they can have, right? What, what would you do? Where would you start? Well, I would guess that you would probably start by researching uh, the existing approaches. Right? Maybe someone has already researched all this, all this stuff about conversations, about how, how to have productive conversations, change minds, to better understand each other. Maybe. And we, we, th that's what we did, obviously, with street epistemology. And uh, also, you would probably want to find active practitioners, practitioners who achieve the best results. So who, who in the, the whole world can have productive conversations and you can watch them, you can learn from them, and you can just see that the results are the best. Uh, you, you would probably do that. And you would try to also look into science of it. You would try to um, research the modern uh, psychological findings, um, maybe couple it with the uh, philosophy and scientific method and to merge all that and to to see whether it has substance, maybe to, to conduct some experiments and see whether, whether it works. So if, if there is already a, the state of the art and someone is doing what you want to do, of course, you just wanna take it. You don't need to invent the wheel, right? But if there is none of it yet or not quite, you want to create it. So that's basically what uh, true cosmology movement has achieved to do and we're still on this way and uh, if you are if you ask me a question how do we know that it actually works short answer would be we don't kind of because serious technology has not been directly studied yet to this point but of course that doesn't mean that we don't 
know anything about it and we don't have any evidence. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about that. As I mentioned, if we were to look for best practitioners or find the best available approaches there are, unfortunately, you would be hard pressed to do so. There's just not much you can look up to uh, in order to learn how to have the most productive conversations. Yes, there is psychotherapy and we can learn a lot from that. Uh, there is also, you might uh, think about Socratic method. Socrates has been around two, two and a half thousand years ago. But then again, try to look for people who uh, actively engage in Socratic uh, dialogues and being successful at it and having all kinds of resources to learn from. Unfortunately, you'll be hard pressed to do so. So what we did in Strategic Cosmology, we tried to merge everything that we could that we could lay our eyes on in terms of having most productive conversation, uh, psychological research, and uh, to take all that. And on top of that, even to experiment more and see what works best, what works uh, less. So that's where we are at this moment. Uh, also, we're uh, in an active stage of finding researchers who will conduct some actual studies on street epistemology. But uh, as we don't have it yet, we can talk about some related studies that we can uh, learn from a lot. So let's do that. First one would be deep canvassing. Deep canvassing is a, a type of canvassing uh, which is usually used during a political campaigns. It's a door-to-door -door direct interaction with voters in order to sway them to vote uh, for some specific laws, for example. And this study has been published uh, in the science journal and it showed tremendously positive results in terms of, uh, in, in terms of how many voters were swayed in the direction and they were campaigning for transgender rights laws. And uh, it showed great results, as I said, and what we can learn from it is that it's very important to have meaningful conversation with a person for them to be genuinely reflecting on their views. And uh, it's important to show, to, to, to have high rapport and to show some understanding. So that's uh, what Deep Canvases we're doing very well, and that's what we're trying to learn from them. Next is motivational interviewing. It is a psychotherapeutic approach that is aimed uh, at uh, changing behaviors of clients. And it is also, not also, but it is even more heavily researched and uh, it uh, the research is very positive and uh, so, what we learn from it is that a uh, few things actually, and you can even say that through Smology has uh, largely been in influenced by motivational interviewing. And what we learn from it is that it's important, first of all, to understand what uh, stage your conversation partner is at. Uh, for example, if they are absolutely, co absolutely confident and they just don't think that anything can sway them, then, uh, then you can consider just, just planting a seed of doubt as a success uh, and contrast that to if they are 50% confident, then you can actually share a lot of facts and expect them to, to take it up and uh, actually consider them seriously during this conversation. So it would depend on where your interlocutor is at the moment in order to, uh, to set correct goals for the conversation. So you don't expect different interlocutors to, 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 for you to achieve the same goals with them in different conversations. And lots of other stuff we, we can learn from motivational interviewing. I won't go into all of that because uh, we're short on time. So next is Socratic method. And interestingly enough, uh, Socratic method is uh, 
not some um, there, there is no specific uh, method probably that that everybody would refer to when speaking to, uh, about Socratic method. Usually when talk about Socratic method, people might refer to all kinds of just good questioning techniques. Uh, so we could even say that street epistemology is an offshoot of Socratic method. It's a, or you can even say that it's a subset of Socratic method. So what we try to do is we try to implement what Socrates did or what uh, modern Socratic questioning look like, looks like. And there are some studies showing that, uh, for example, using Socratic method in classrooms helps, um, helps improve critical thinking of the learners. So we try to implement all that as well. This is, by the way, a link not to a study, but to a, an article that I found helpful about Socratic method. The, the rest of the links, you, you can use those QR codes to go to the websites. The rest of the links are studies. Next one will be generation effect. This, this speaks to the fact that people tend to learn things better when they think about them themselves not when they are not the, when they read them or being told something and uh, i have to say that this is probably understudied yet but uh, i still guess it's rather relevant because we we want to understand how psychology works right we want to understand how this belief formation process works and um, i guess it's the study just indicates not shows because it, it, it needs to be researched more, but it indicates in the direction that you want your conversation partner or yourself for that matter to think about something on their own in order to achieve better results, in order to have more efficient reflection on the matter, in, in order to remember things more in this case. So you might want to account for that. This is another study called Neural Correlates of Maintaining One's Political Beliefs in the Face of Counter Evidence. Uh, this was published in Nature uh, some years ago. And this speaks to the fact that when, when people, it was done about political beliefs, when people are facing um, information that strictly counters what they deeply believe, they feel at least their brain uh, acts in a similar manner as when it acts when, when a person is being physically threatened. So what we, what we can take from that is when you just present counter arguments, when you try to attack with words, I mean, uh, a belief that a person is, um, is holding and that is very important for them, a deep, deeply held belief, chances are they might just um, they might just get defensive and they might not be open in that uh, state of mind to gen genuine reflection. And that's what we want, right? We want genuine reflection on the part of our conversation partner and our own, of course. So keep that in mind as well. Another one is illusion of explanatory depth. And this is about uh, the fact that sometimes, and maybe even a lot of the times people, when people think they know how, how um, things work and they think they have accurate beliefs about something, it might not actually be the case. And in, in, in those studies, people were asked whether they think they know how the toilet works or the, uh, the bicycle and First, they could say, "Yeah, sure, I know how it works." And when they were asked to draw, to to make a drawing and to explain how it works, they found for themselves that they actually did not know it that well as they thought they they did. And yeah, so it's rather sad on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's good that when people are people are just asked to explain what they know, they might understand on their own that they didn't know as much as they thought they did. And it might uh, help them reflect on it as well. 
And another study is about fact checks versus attitudes. It was done, I think, during the presidential campaign of uh, 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and about it was done to Donald Trump, Trump supporters. Uh, so researchers showed Donald Trump supporters some facts that showed that Donald Trump was wrong when he said some specific things. And uh, they wanted to see whether it would, uh, first of all, whether, whether Donald Trump supporters would take those facts and would agree that Donald Trump was wrong when, where they thought previously that he was right and whether it would change their attitude towards uh, Donald Trump uh, and whether they would still want to vote for him. So what it showed is that when people were shown, shown those facts, they did in fact uh, take those facts and they did agree that, yeah, sure, I, now I know this, so may, maybe Donald Trump was even wrong. But interestingly enough, that did not sway their attitude at all whatsoever. It did not change their willingness to vote for Trump. So what, what we might learn from that is that just providing facts, even if they are correct, might even make your conversation partner agree with, the, with those facts, but it wouldn't um, necessarily sway their belief, especially a deeply held belief, their attitude, because this is much more important for them. Probably this is deeper. And in order to discuss that, you you probably need to understand them better, uh, deeper, and not just uh, sharing some facts. Facts don't sway minds, if you will. OK, oh, don't change minds, I should have said. Uh, motivated reasoning is the next one. Motivated reasoning is similar to confirmation bias. You might have heard about it. it, it it's a bias that we all share. Uh, it, it means that when we want to believe something, when we believe something and we want to believe something, we tend to look for information that shows we were correct. And we tend to just overlook the information that might show us that we were wrong. So that's called a motivated reasoning in that sense. And we should also take account for that, uh, of course, because it's very, very prevalent. There are the, the, the significant uh, amount of research behind it. Yeah, so this, is, uh, this was the last study I wanted to share. This uh, is not at all an extensive list of different scientific data or other data that that we use in street epistemology to try to take account for and try to implement in our conversations. But uh, I hope you get some idea that uh, about what we tried to do here. So we tried to take the best, as I said, and to be the practitioners of uh, those productive conversations about any kinds of beliefs that are unfortunately lacking in this world today. Not a lot of uh, people are actually doing and researching it. So uh, we just hope that we will uh, achieve some results with that. And here's the website, streetsmology.com. You might find uh, all kinds of uh, information there. You might want to join uh, some practice meetings on streetsmology. You might want to read some blog posts uh, or find links to all kinds of materials uh, already existing on street epistemology. Right now, we're also working on a course on street epistemology. We're also uh, renewing our website. So if you like what we're doing, also please consider uh, going to Patreon and uh, just helping us out uh, because we were in the middle of uh, several huge um, projects, uh, some of which I've already mentioned. And uh, yeah, so to conclude what I wanted to say, we, we take through epistemology to me is the science, the modern science of having the most productive conversations about beliefs uh, there is. So it, it is a science in the sense that it doesn't mean that what we're doing right now is the best way to do it. But 
we're just trying to to merge all the existing information the data and our personal experience to to come up with the best uh, tools to use in, in conversations about beliefs and uh, we are continuing to to work on that to um, have conversations record them uh, conduct workshops uh, write materials and also to have actual scientific studies that would directly uh, studies if through epistemology uh, effectiveness it's not easy but it's doable and we're on the way there but so far here we are i guess i will stop at this point and i will be happy to answer your questions oh roman thank you so much this was our applause will be silent because everybody's muted but uh thank you thank you so much for all uh for this it really made a lot of sense to me um i uh we have a group called building trust in uh the humanist group mm -hmm. our humanist group and we're really working at how do you talk to people um there's so much division right now uh be it at the the you know christmas or you know the thanksgiving table or just out in public that people are not talking to each other and uh that your the the your group is doing the research that says this the, here's how you do it i i know with um i i've been trained in motivational interviewing as a medical professional mm -hmm. and there it, it were it, it it worked for me uh, as long as i understood i wasn't going to make the change that afternoon you know as i would treat my patient it was a it was a relationship i i, I feel like your organization understands that it's a relationship uh in a conversation you know that you may make a tiny little just put a seed in someone's head and that's that's a that's a good thing to do but the important thing is connection human connection such a very well done thank you yeah well, we, we we are going to have some questions i have no doubt uh what I all the way from new mexico is uh todd kimball you're asked that you're going to ask the first question there my friend come on in thank you helen and thank you roman for a very educational and informative um, presentation this morning. You're doing very important work, thank you. Uh, my question is, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that you need to have a little bit of a rapport with a person or know them a little bit before engaging in a street epistemology conversation. Do you have any thoughts or has there been any research on, you know, whether you can have that conversation with an angry stranger or if you need some rapport first? Yeah. Thank you for the question, first of all, and I think you can definitely have a conversation with a stranger, but I wouldn't recommend having a conversation with an angry stranger. I, I would even go as far as to say that if emotions are high in, in conversation, and it doesn't matter whether it's a stranger or not, mm -hmm. if someone is angry or agitated in another way or frustrated or or any other emotion that's negative in some way just don't do it just work it out first or let them calm down or just be there for them be empathetic to to the cause of uh, their emotions but don't don't talk about their beliefs if they are agitated about something else or even about their beliefs doesn't matter so ideally it's um, think about it this way it's difficult to, to change minds. How, think about the last time you have changed your beliefs about something. Sometimes it's even difficult to remember last time you did that, right? And it's difficult for other people too. So uh, in order to do, in order to uh, make the right setup for, for a genuine reflection, it's difficult enough so in order to do that we need to take into account everything and emotions are of course a very important part of it uh, so ideally you want both conversation partners be calm and composed and ready and willing uh, consent to what to, to this conversation about this specific topic with this specific person uh, and uh, have maintained rapport throughout the, the conversation if any of this is missing, if someone is in a hurry, 
or doesn't want to be there or anything else, it just wouldn't work probably. So just disengage or wait for another opportunity. Okay, thank you. Willie, you have a question. Come on uh, screen and we'll uh, unmute and ask your question, please. Um, I have a couple of different people in my life who I end up in arguments with a lot. And it's always kind of the same thing. It's people on welfare are just lazy. And I don't know why I have to pay my taxes for that. And no matter what I, what I say, we end up in a screaming match. Is there any, is there, what is the right approach? Do I just say, do I just repeat what they say back to them? Because otherwise we're gonna end up in an argument. Yes, thank you, Willie. It, it is difficult indeed. And sometimes it is more difficult with some conversation partners is more difficult than with others. And uh, for some people it is, it, it comes more difficult than to others. But <clears throat> what I would suggest you to do to try to improve is first, uh, try to remember that you don't want it to end in a screaming mesh mm -hmm. and try to, uh, to look for the first time when it when you start to get agitated to try to look for triggers that start when this when they say it i get agitated oh all right so as soon as they say it mm -hmm. and you you can even uh, say to yourself what they what specifically they say what words do they have to say in order to get you agitated so since you already know that you might want to train yourself in advance just when you are alone for example on your own think about it imagine yourself in this situation and try to ask yourself whether you want to be agitated when they say that why do you want to feel what what you feel can you can you try to remain calm and composed and uh, what what would it take for you to do it so all, all kinds of things like that so basically you just want to prepare yourself in advance for difficult situations. It, I'm not saying it will be easy. Uh, it might be difficult. Also, you might not necessarily want to do it alone. You might want to do it with another person, but who is not, not the one who makes you agitated, but who you can discuss it with. Well, in one and group, just... in one case, it was my book club. And there's just one person in our group that has that feeling. And she always says, I feel like you're all ganging up on me. So right. it doesn't work to do it in a group, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it will take uh, some specific setup to reflect on that. Again, you need to be calm. Um, I, I bet that's the problem. I, I bet it's me. It is difficult. I, I get it. We, I think we all we all do. We've been there. We we all get agitated sometimes. But good news is, the more you practice, the more you're willing to actually overcome this, the better you get at it. And at some point, it just becomes your second nature, and you just <laughs> yeah, you just overcome it in time. But oh. it it takes time and effort, of course. All right, stay calm. I'll work yeah. on it. Even if it's easier said than done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sheila, mm -hmm. I missed your comment in the beginning. I'm sorry. Uh, Sheila wrote, I wish I'd had such a teacher as Roman Tarasov in my youth. Sheila, any, any re what, what is it that you saw today that um, made Roman? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not putting my camera on because I sure. won't play. Um, Fine. But, but Roman, I think you're amazing. And I don't know what you're mm -hmm. doing in Thailand, but my sister lives in the town of Pai. Do you know Pai way up in the north? Yes, but I have not been there. Okay. So um, are, you a, are you a professor? No, <laughs> I, I work in an educational business, but I'm not a professor. Okay. Well, you're your description, your explanation, your teaching, I think is 
superb. I learned more from your presentation. So concise, so co so clear that, um, yes, I, I do wish that I had an educator like you in my youth, but it's not too late. It's never too late. <laughs> we, we are all um, learning always. We are lifelong learners. So thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, Joyce, can you, Joyce has uh, put her name in the list. Joyce, come on in and ask your question. Um, hi, Roman. Um, Helen mentioned our building trust group, and we have tried mm -hmm. several things to uh, to engage with people with opposite perspectives. And we took our little tent out to a park last fall and uh, set up our signs. We want to talk. Let's talk. And we even offered mm -hmm. cookies if someone would talk to us. Okay. Oh. Well, <laughs> we um, we had some interesting experiences. We found, first of all, that we have to go to people. They don't come to us. So we started walking around in small groups and then we engaged with people. Mm -hmm. But we engaged with one woman who came back to the tent and then only two of us were left there. The rest of us were walking around. But we had worked on listening. And one of the big organizations in this country has put together a coalition under the title of L Listen First. So we had worked on that and uh, we had two of us had been members of crossing party lines for several years and what happened to the people who were in the tent was that the, the the woman who came over was so willing to talk about her point of view mm -hmm. and our group was so um willing to listen she they never got to say a word she never breathed i don't think she does inform them and inform them and inform them of her point of view. And finally, the rest of us came back and said, well, I think we have to go now or, you know, some we tried to, we were gracious, I think. But um, we got a couple of ideas from Empathy Circle about timing your talk and so forth. But do you have suggestions for that sort of thing? Yes, thank you for the question. And it does happen and it, it might be difficult and even frustrating at point at times. So. There are several things uh, I can think of that might be helpful. First, the, um, you need to um, you need to think about how to interrupt your interlocutor gracefully and when to do it. Because sometimes, of course, you need to do it. As a, as a rule of thumb, of course, we do not interrupt our interlocutors. <laughs> just to be sure, of course, we want to be polite, but. Sometimes, of course, we do. When when it happens, for example, when a person talks and talks and talks and doesn't stop, and we are not interested anymore, or we have other things to, to do, or I don't know, we just don't feel ourselves in this conversation anymore. So there are several ways to do that, to interrupt your conversation partner gracefully. One of them would be to, to just start saying with, um, repeating what you heard, the main uh, the main idea that they said. Oh, so you mean this and that and that? Okay, okay, I get it. So let me ask you a question now. You can say that, and it might actually they might not even notice it because some people just um, feel it's natural to interrupt each other. Some some people, like me, for example, wait for for conversation partner to stop before I start talking. But other people say that they talk because the organization partner is being silent and yeah it might it, it broke my mind when i first heard that but apparently a lot of people are like that they would just talk and not because they want to talk but just because they don't want awkward silences and they just don't know how to stop sometimes so it's okay for them for, totally to be interrupted but of course try to be polite about it and um, as I said, you can just start by repeating what you've heard and ask a question. Another suggestion would be if, for example, you just want to disengage, if you don't want to continue this conversation, just say so. Imagine yourself in a situation where you are talking to someone and they don't want to listen to you. Would you want to stop? Would you want to know that they don't want to listen to you anymore? Probably you would. And so do they. So if you don't want to listen to them anymore, just politely say so. Uh, you could say, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, right now I have to admit that I feel a little bit uh, frustrated or agitated about my personal stuff. And uh, I, I just have to admit that I can't 
keep track of uh, everything you're saying. So if you don't mind, uh, might, maybe we, we can uh, briefly end this conversation in the next two minutes. I want to understand you, of course. So let me maybe rephrase the main thesis that you're trying to, to say. Something like that. Just a couple of suggestions. There could be more, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, I might mention that Empathy Circle suggested in some of their talks, they tell the person they're speaking with before it starts that they're going to set a timer and each person can talk for so long. Mm -hmm. We haven't tried that yes, yet. Yes, that's one way to do it, sure. Uh, Hank Rob had a comment uh, uh, about uh, rapport. He said your methods uh, will actually build rapport. Hank, you want to come on and say anything more about that? Yeah, I, I just let's see. Yeah, I would I would just say that that um, all of the things that uh, Roman outlined, if you perform them, uh, you won't have to wait to get rapport. Those are the things that build rapport. So yes, even exactly. if you're dealing with someone who's very angry and you're reflecting back to them, oh, so this is your point of view. This is what you really want me to understand. Do I, do I have I got it right yet? If I don't, please explain it to me. Those are the, those are the kind of activities that will build rapport. So uh, if, if, you, if you wait around to get rapport and don't do anything, hoping that somehow it will drop from the sky, um, you're, you're missing out on a lot of activities that we know are the things that tend to build it. Absolutely. I can only second that. Thank you, Hank. Yes, you, you just have to be there for your interlocutor, be genuinely interested, and that uh, on, its, on itself by itself will show some results. Also, if it so happens that they have some feelings or emotions, you can address that too separately. Just don't talk about their beliefs yet. Talk about their emotions. Are you feeling frustrated because you don't feel safe here for some reason or whatever you think they're feeling and why? And that might also show some empathy and help with building the core. Thank you. Uh, Jules, you have a question. Come on, can you come in? Jules, Jules, there you are. Come on in and ask your question. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Roman, for uh, giving us a 1 a.m. Uh, presentation. <laughs> and uh, this whole experience is an equalizer because all of the down things regarding the net and the spreading of misinformation uh, are sort of pushed into the background when something like this occurs and it shows the good uh, things about the internet. My comment, not more than a question, is this. I'm married to the same lady who I'm very fond of for mm -hmm. more than 65 years. And in that whole, and she is a very, very bright lady, a American lit major, English lit major. And throughout our early years, there was a lot of discussion that went nowhere because she had a programmed approach to certain kinds of events in life without getting into the nitty gritty details, but she saw the uh, unfairness towards women throughout literature, throughout politics, throughout life in general, throughout mm -hmm. religion. In fact, we were orthodox in how the woman would have to be kept upstairs uh, away from the men while we pray, or the woman couldn't go to the burial ground to bury their spouses because they may be having menses and therefore they're unclean. So mm -hmm. all of that in aggregate pushed her into a corner which made her very angry. All right, so jump ahead, year 35, 40. I'm beginning to understand where she's coming from. I'm beginning to see where the anger comes from. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning to see that in fact, she's right, that it's so pervasive that I had no understanding of that core insult to being a female. So what I really am trying to say, Roman, is that it took a lifetime for me to fully comprehend where her mindset is and how I don't have to just tolerate it, I can nourish it. 
I can get something out of it and she and I could continue to have a dialogue that is meaningful, even though it may differ, we're still connected. Now, how does one do this in the course of daily living in a short happening? I mean, it's near, and from my experience, it's near impossible to reach any kind of rapport that would lead to productive discussion. You mean, would not be, be enough, any kind of rapport would not be enough to have such deep understanding that you had eventually with your wife? Uh, I mean, reaching an end point in that uh, rapport that says, gee, we are really, next time we meet, we're gonna have an easier time of discussing our differences. I mean, are, are we good enough as given the human condition to push our ego aside and allow that person to, to make their point uh, well-received and respected. I may be confusing the issue a little bit, I don't know. Yeah, no, sure, sure. I, I think I understand uh, at least most of what, what you're saying and uh, it, it is sometimes difficult. It is difficult sometimes to just process what another person is saying or to just uh, try to model it in your own uh, head to truly and deeply understand to build rapport as well. And th there is actually no universal remedy to, for that. You, th there's just mm -hmm. no a magic button. Uh, there, are, right. there can only be some tools that might increase the likelihood or decrease the, the time and effort that you spend doing that. Because maybe if you ask some uh, nice questions, you know how to ask them, it might just bring you a little bit closer, and not necessarily all the way uh, in one go. But still, yeah, sure, there is no remedy and it, 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 it might be very difficult sometimes. And I, I also think I understand why she was angry with, with all that. I'm angry with that. It's, it's not fair. Me? Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about me? Yes. <laughs> Where was I? He agrees with your, your feminist oh, uh, thank you. platform. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I, okay. I, I appreciate your being here and giving us your time. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, it takes time. I mean, I think, and you're you're not saying it would take one conversation to change someone's mind. That's oh good. no, sometimes no. Well, most of the times, no. Of course, yeah. Ideally, you want to have an ongoing relationship okay. again, and a, a series of conversation. You don't have to do everything you can do in one go. Yeah. 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 So it takes time and. Maybe even 65 years, that could be, it's just like. A... <laughs> Hopefully less, but, Hopefully, but yes. yeah, why not? It's, why not? It's, it's pretty it's lucky enough. there, fella, to have 65 years with that lovely lady. But, uh, yes. Uh, Dave, you have a question, come on in. A actually, I'll wait for the other questioners. Oh, okay, Suzanne, then you have a question, come on in. Hi there, thanks so much, Roman. It's opened up a lot of, uh, of our doors here. And uh, it's a nice, pleasant, sunny morning here. So uh, anyway, uh, a few years back, I was involved in co-counseling. And I think it's probably still going on, but it was a great technique where you sit with a partner and you want to talk about your, your whatever's troubling you. And so you take turns. And the job of the speaker would be to share. And the job of the other person was just to listen. That was the job just to try to understand what the other person was saying. And then you mm -hmm. took turns. <clears throat> so you each had a chance to, to talk. And then, mm -hmm. and then at the end, you would probably, we collaborated, you know, about our sharing. And I thought, you know, the skill of listening is so underdeveloped in our culture today. And, you know, maybe that would be a good way to start with anyone, with all of our friends even, just to have that time of, you know, how is it going? I want, I want to hear, you know, and, and just that part. That's what I wanted to say was the listening part is such a key uh, to it. And um, it is just the beginning, though. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Susan. That's a great point, actually. 
active listening and reflective listening are just one of the ones of the important tools that we use in strategic cosmology among other conversational approaches. But without those tools, if, if you can't be an active listener well enough, you just won't go far. That, that's totally true. Yeah. And the technique that uh, you, you just mentioned can actually be pretty good training for, for that. Roman, I had thank you, thank you, Suzanne. That was that was very well spoken. I have you know I because I've I've done some studying with motivational interviewing, they really push uh, or in, reinforce that uh, almost laughably that it doesn't work very well with family. That it works well professionally when you're dealing with a client and there's some emotional division, but that with family, uh, it often you it, it's difficult, even more, much more difficult to do motivational interviewing with. Uh, techniques with family. And what I understand from I'm understanding from what you're saying is um, street epistemology wants to move beyond that, wants to move into the fact that you could speak to intimate partners, strangers, uh, family members, and use these techniques. So there's a lot, how, how do you really, oh, we, how do you, I think he'll be okay, guys. Yeah, here you go. How do you separate emotion during your conversation? I mean, it's, you've got to, I think, right? To keep going, to hmm. not get emotional? That's, that's an interesting question. Thank you, Helen. And I've heard two different things. One is that motivational interviewing suggests that it's more difficult uh, most of the times to talking to your family members like that yeah, than to right. other people. Difficult. Yeah, yeah. They, they use the word difficult. Yes. Yeah, not and impossible. I, to that, I would say that uh, probably it it's almost the same as cosmology. At least it, it would depend on, on specific people, of course. Maybe you have such a nice uh, relationship with your mother that you can talk about anything, right? Maybe it wouldn't take more effort than talking about... Uh, the same topic with someone else but as a uh, as a general rule probably it is more difficult to talk to your family members because they know you better because they expect maybe some other type of interaction from you or all kinds of things that they can allow themselves to do during an interaction that other people wouldn't allow so yeah it might be more tricky with family members so we usually suggest to uh before trying it out on your family members to to go practice with uh, other aspiring uh, street epistemologists to just train <laughs> together oh, yet yeah. yeah, to, to, to to be better prepared okay. so the, we, about that and uh, the second part you, you you asked whether you should try to uh, uh, restrict emotion. your emotions yes yeah i'm i'm not sure you need to do that actually because um, i think we all have emotions. It's a very important and natural part of who we are and what, what we are. It, I, I don't think there's a way to just uh, not feel what we feel um, or anything like that. But what we can and probably should do is just try to process it, to take it into account. Uh, for example, uh, I'm talking to you now. I feel lots of stuff. I feel I can feel appreciation. I can feel uh, joy. I can feel uh, I don't know a, a little bit of weariness. All kinds of stuff, and it's okay. I can talk about it. And um, so, one of the things actually you can do in a conversation is talk about your emotions if uh, you feel like it. You know, if you feel it would be relevant to the conversation. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. You did. You did. You got okay. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Lawrence, you have a question. Come on in, Lawrence. Thank yeah. Um, it, it's um, well. Th the first thing that occurs to me is that a lot of the things that you've been talking about um, have to do with um, there's a heavy personal element involved. So you, it seems to me you can when you're having a conversation with someone and you're trying to get them to see your point of view, you can either be talking about things that have a lot of personal import for you and your partner, or 
you could be talking about things that uh, the, the, the way I see it are, are more in line with epistemology in the sense that for me, epistemology is talking about things that really don't have anything to do with the person. Suppose that I were in a disagreement. Suppose Joanna and I were in a disagreement about interpretations of quantum mechanics. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have any, anything personally invested in this. Uh, I think that uh, there's an example of that. Um, uh, Sean Carroll uh, has a certain view about how to interpret quantum mechanics, but he's tolerant and sees other points of view on that. Now, let me shift over to something that is uh, not so scientific. Joanne and I yesterday were looking at something very, very interesting. It was a um, uh, uh, testimony before Congress involving two people on the subject of reparations. The two persons involved were Ta-Nehisi Coates and Coleman Hughes. And they have totally different perspectives on whether or not a certain proposed House bill that would institute reparations for in racial injustices in the past. Very, very interesting. Now, this is an example for me, and I think for Joanna, because neither of us is Black. Uh, this is an issue that doesn't, uh, reparations does, does not involve us personally. But the thing about that conversation between those two persons was such that each of us could see the merits of the position on either side. And they were in total 180 degree disagreement. And so um, this is just a long winded way of my putting a question to you. And the question is this, when two people are in a conversation about things that have nothing to do with anything, especially personal, and if there are two completely different points of view on whatever they're talking about, whether it's racism or quantum mechanics, um, isn't it desirable to try to see, to, to try to hold back from coming down on one point of view or the other and seeing the merits and demerits of each point of view and being able to live with that. Thank you, Lauren. That's a very interesting question. Uh, um, let me try to rephrase and you tell me if, if I understood you. So I, I'll try to simplify the question. Say we were talking about the shape of the earth. So I can say the, the earth is round, I believe it, but the shape of the earth is, has nothing to do with me personally. It, it is what it is, right? So how, how is it personal, uh, you might wonder. And uh, when talking about it, what would be maybe the benefit of just looking for merits in each position, whether the earth is round or whether it's flat or whatever else the shape could be? Um, is that what, what you're asking? Uh, no, I don't think so, because in okay. a case like this, it'd be like talking to a Trump supporter. I, I think what the, the two people involved need to be approaching a subject matter in an intellectually honest way. And it's very, very difficult for me to see that a flat earther or a Trump supporter is someone who's even worth discussing anything with to begin with. All right. So would it be correct then to say that what you're talking about mostly is something not, not as simple as the shape of the earth, but maybe about policies, about how we want to change, how we want to shape our world, our uh, society Yes. Uh, in some specific sense. And where when we're talking about some difficult matters, like, for example, how to how to tackle this vaccine uh, problem or whether we should close everything or whether we should make it mandatory or to what degree to do it. And there are downsides and benefits to each decision because obviously there is no ultimate uh, correct decision. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yes, yeah, something like that, yeah. All right, so yeah, and then what would be the question then? <laughs> Well, again, please. would it be desirable for two people to try to see something, each of them from an opposing, from opposing points mm, right, right. and being comfortable that something can be seen in either of two mm -hmm. ways and the two ways are incompatible? Yeah. So, you know, to question 
So to answer that question, I would say first we should think about our goals in a conversation. In in different conversation, we can have different goals. Right. Uh, for example, in one case, I might just want to say something and uh, let the audience of 50 people like like you here to just hear me out and that's it. Or in another instance, I want to uh, talk about a specific to talk to a specific person and I want to help them reflect on things. And those could be different approaches and diff different tools could be used for that. So if you want to, um, for example, help another person reflect on something, then chances are you want to first understand them and uh, see their reasoning, this trunk of the, of the tree, that, of, of, see the methods they're using and discuss them, discuss th this, um, their reasoning with them. Uh, another thing, another goal might be to just share your views productively, to just maybe I want to, uh, I, I don't know a lot about this issue, but you clearly know a lot more than I do. So I just want to learn from you. And so I want to, if I want you to share with me what you think is best, the best course of action, the benefits that you see in it, the downsides that you see in it. I then might want to share what what I know about it. So we might just want to share and because there is no some no deep fundamental disagreement, maybe we just understand both that it's an intrinsically difficult decision. So again, depends on our goals. Sometimes we want to share, sometimes we want to discuss, sometimes we want to engage in critical thinking or all of it. Or, okay, so yeah. so I, I think I think what I'm seeing here is um, um, that you need to be trusting the motives of the person that you're talking to. If that's not in place, then I suppose any conversation would be pointless if you don't trust where they're coming from. What do you mean, trust where, where they're coming from? Trust the, uh, that they're not being hypocritical and that they're not merely professing a belief, as many churchgoers do, by the way. <laughs> uh, you, uh, or they're not just going along with some political thing for reasons that are um, not epistemologically worthy. Mm -hmm. that, that is actually a tricky question to me. Uh, it's not clear uh, because, again, it would depend on my goals. For example, if a person says they believe something, but um, and, and they, they just say it and... I have no good reason for thinking they are lying to me, but at the same time, what they're saying doesn't make much sense to me. So I might not put a lot of trust in what they're saying, right? Uh, I might want to still discuss it with them because maybe they are confused. Maybe they may maybe they are genuinely confused. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't I don't think that it often happens when people are uh, lying on purpose or. Uh, trying to deceive you, right? Usually, some, sometimes um, people, there, there is a concept, I think, um, first proposed by Daniel Dennett, belief in belief. So sometimes people yes. might believe something and uh, maybe what their reasons are not even what you would call reasons, but they still believe it maybe because they think it's good for them and maybe, maybe because they want to believe it, but still they believe it. So whether they actually believe it or they think they believe it, mm. there is a very subtle uh, difference. And uh, sometimes it might matter for me in a conversation, but a lot of the times it actually won't uh, matter for me if I want to mm. just discuss it with them. So again, it, it, it probably won't matter for me if I want to engage in critical thinking with them. Thank um, you. It's really epistemology. Mm -hmm. That's good conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren.